two. The object of the cooperative operation of the civil power and the ecclesiastical power. So the point is that, uh, just by review, that there is a, uh, there should not be a confusion of the powers. There is not an absolute union of the powers. Each has its own distinct um, sphere, uh, and, but they do cross and they do have some common areas uh, because man is composed of body and soul and therefore in a way the state takes care of the body and the church takes care of the soul but they happen to be together in the same person so there there is a there should be a uh, a union in the sense that there is a uh, a deep cooperation between church and state that's that's the view of the church so the church favors union of church and state in that sense The, uh, the common object and end of the operation of the civil government and of the ecclesiastical government is the perfection of man. So man, body and soul, should be brought to his proper ends. But the perfection of men is contained in two kinds of goods, of which one is temporal and the other eternal. But these goods must be bound together in an orderly way as a single total good in the unity of man because he's both body and soul. But this ordered connection of goods is necessary both in the individual, in individual men and in the multitude, since the same thing must be the judgment of the end of the whole multitude as of a single man, as St. Thomas says. In other words, what, what is good for the single man is good for the whole multitude. The end, however, of a human congregation or society, since it is also the end of ruling a society is easily understood. The object and end of each power, while the action of neither is disturbed, is the one total good of the society. See, so they're both working for the one total good of the society, which is connected in an ordered manner, just as body and soul are. These things ha having been said, it is clear that the good, which must be connected in an ordered manner in the citizens, requires the ordered connection of the two powers, of which God has given a participation in the government of the human race. Leo XIII said, The Almighty, therefore, has given the charge of the human race to two powers, the ecclesiastical and the civil, the one being set over divine, the other over human things. Such Each in its kind is supreme, each has fixed limits within which it is contained, limits which are defined by the nature and special object of the province of each, so that there is, we may say, an orbit traced out within which the action of each is brought into play by its own native right. But inasmuch as each of these two powers has authority over the same subjects, and as it might come to pass that one and the same thing, related differently, but still remaining one and the same thing, might be brought to the jurisdiction and determination of both. Therefore God, who foresees all things, and who is the author of these two powers, has marked out the course of each in right correlation to the other. For the powers that are, are ordained of God. There must accordingly exist between these two powers a certain orderly connection, which may be compared to the union of the soul and the body in man." All right, so that's a quote from St. Paul, the powers that are ordained of God. So uh, that's Leo the Thirteenth. That's probably, I, I didn't have to check the reference. It's probably Immortality Day. Judgments of the Church Against Separation. Gregory the Sixteenth said this concerning separation of church and state, nor can we predict happier times for religion and government from the plans of those who desire vehemently to separate the church from the state and to break the mutual concord between temporal authority and the priesthood. It is certain that that concord, which, always, which was always favorable and beneficial, 
for the sacred and civil order is feared by the shameless lovers of liberty. So the church is clearly, clearly against separation of church and state. Pius IX in the syllabus lists this proposition 55. The church ought to be separated from the state and the state from the church. That's condemned. Leo XIII confirms the prescriptions of his predecessors in the encyclicals Immortale Dei and Libertas. In this last encyclical, he calls the false system of the reasons for separating the church and state a pernicious idea. These things give no occasion for subterfuge. It means there's no way that liberals can somehow uh, interpret these in a benign way. Thesis, the church must not be separated from the state nor the state from the church. Arguments, number one, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. But God willed that the civil and ecclesiastical powers be joined. Indeed, each power, inasmuch as it has come from God, is ordered. Each one dissociates, <coughs> if one dissoci dissociates the reasons for church and state, disorder arises. For their subjects are the same, meaning the human race, and not infrequently they deal with the same objects, though in different ways. Whenever this occurs, since a state of conflict is absurd and manifestly repugnant to the most wise ordinance of God, there must necessarily exist some order or mode of procedure to remove the occasions of difference and contention and to secure harmony in all things. That's from Libertas. Add to this that God forbids that the state be separated from the church. Proof of the major. The state as the state, because even the civil <coughs> society is from God, must worship and revere God. So civil society is something that is from God in as much as it is absolutely natural to man to form a civil society. And that the, the civil society obtains its authority from God. So the state, just as the individual, owes worship to God as the state. And that has been true, as I said, in all of human history, uh, even pagan states. Aztecs and Incas, etc. Um, and has only oddly become extinct with the uh, Enlightenment and 19th century. And it's not totally extinct. In the sense that European states generally do not have separation of church and state. They say they do, but they don't. They oppress the church. It is not a totally different entity. Two, the state or the civil power is constituted in such a way that it not only favors the temporal good of the citizens, but that it helps the citizens attain their eternal salvation. But this happiness is begun on earth and is to be consummated in heaven through the true religion which the Catholic Church contains. Therefore, it is necessary that church and state be joined together. So the state ought to help the church in a achieving its goals. And the church ought to help the state too in achieving its legitimate goals in the sense that it, uh, and it does so by forming citizens in morality. The, the, the morality of the citizen is the greatest single factor for the unity and peace of the state. See, and also it upholds authority.
it's always anti-revolution and anti-insurrection. It upholds the state. Even a persecuting state, it upholds. Does not incite its subjects to, to revolt. Therefore, it is necessary that church and state be... We learn the same thing from St. Thomas, who says in the De Regimine Principum, it pertains to each thing to accomplish, accomplish whatever is ordered to something else as to an end, and he must pay attention, to that, pay, pay attention that his work be in accordance with the end. So again, it pertains to each thing to accomplish whatever is ordered to something else as to an end. See, so if, if come in. T Tobias is not in this class. He should be in his room. Why do we need a plumber? Oh, okay. All right. Right, so, if one thing is a means and another thing is, is an end, you must be careful to accomplish whatever pertains to the end. And he must pay attention that his work be in accordance with the end, so that you're, what you're doing actually does pertain to the end and not towards something else. In this way, the swordsmith makes a sword in such a way that it is suitable for fighting, and the builder must build the house in such a way that it is apt to be lived in. Because, therefore, the end of the life by which we live well in the present is celestial beatitude, it pertains to the duty of the king, for this reason, to procure the good life of the multitude according as it is congruous with the attainment of celestial beatitude. In other words, all of the temporal must be ordered toward the celestial as a means to an end. Argument two, whatever things are ordered to procure one total good must coordinate their action into one. So, for example, building a house, there's one total good. So it involves many contractors and they all have to cooperate toward that one goal. But the civil and ecclesiastical powers are ordered to procuring one total good, which is the good life of man and his happiness. Therefore, church and state must work together. The conclusion is most apparent from the help which A, the state is able to give to the church, and B, the church is able to give to the state. So the help of the state. St. Thomas says that the help which the state can give to the church comprises a few things, since he teaches that it pertains to the duty of the ruler to procure the good life of the multitude, by that reason according as it is congruous with the obtainment of celestial beatitude, namely that he command those things which lead to celestial beatitude, and that he forbid those things which are contrary to it as much as possible. In other words, the laws of the state and the enforcement of the state must be in accordance with Catholic morality. So those things ought to be outlawed, which are outlawed by the, the Catholic moral teaching, and, and uh, those things should be approved, which are approved by Catholic moral teaching. See, and when you have separation of church and state, again, you have a, a legislative body and a judicial body, etc., that has no reference to any kind of religious moral principle it's just these people and that it's whatever they think and usually they are creatures of the populace you know whatever because they want a the good life you know if you get elected to congress your financial worries are over i don't know if you know that they make fantastic salaries and then they get even if they are in for one term they get this pension and all sorts of privileges it's, it's, it's like the best thing that could ever happen to you is to get elected to Congress. So you don't want the, uh, it's like a big you know, money 
producer is, is being a congressman. It's also great for your pride and your vanity. You know, you're the congressman or you're the senator. You know. It's wonderful for that. So there's a, a, it appeals to people who are both avaricious and vain and who have, are totally unprincipled and will vote for anything that pleases a corrupt populace. That's the moral code. <laughs> You know, that, that's just political and uh, suicide is for the state. I mean, that, that no state can survive like that. It might go for a time. It's the blessings of democracy. See, in a, whatever you want to say about hereditary monarchies, they don't have to account to anybody which is in a way bad, but in a way good. In other words, it, it, they, they don't have to worry about whether they're going to lose their jobs. And so if they are directed by a good moral code, even natural law, you have a much better government than somebody that is in fear always of losing his job and losing all his money and all his prestige. So anyway, so and uh, David, that's in David Jr. And since the church is composed of men and not separated souls, it is possible that it can be helped a great deal by temporal things. Because of these things, Aquinas said, for the good life of man, two things are required. One principal thing, which is the operation according to virtue, for virtue is that by which we live well, but the other is secondary and quasi-instrumental, namely the sufficiency of corporeal goods which are, which, of which the use is necessary for the act of virtue. So corporeal goods exist in order to be virtuous. So you amass... Uh, uh, corporeal things in order to practice virtue. So, of course, you have to live. So you have to have a house, and you have to have food, and then you have to have clothing. You know, so those are basics. But there's other things that pertain to uh, virtue in various ways. Um, uh, art and music and other things that might pertain to your general culture, books and whatnot and so forth reasonable comforts according to your state in life. Sure. You know, it's perfectly normal that a head of state live in some sumptuous place. It is not normal that a dirt farmer live in a palace. And it is not normal that a head of state live in a shack of a dirt farmer. It's incongruous. Because the, 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 the glory of the, the palace does not pertain to the individual as such, but it pertains to the state. See, it is part of the majesty of the state. It's, it has nothing to do with it. He could be a saint or he could be a horrible sinner. It, all the, everything that pertains, all the pomp, etc., and the, pertains to the majesty of the state, which is very important because that, that's part of virtue to manifest the majesty of the state. And that's why certain professions should have a certain, how would you say, dignity. In other words, it, uh, certain professions, the, the more your profession pertains to the common good, the more dignity pertains to the prof profession. So say a medical doctor or I'll say a lawyer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a judge. Uh, well, you know, not you know, all things being equal, just in general, um, a senator or something like that. You know, somebody that's part of the or uh, again, a university professor. 
you know, some of them should be in jail as far as I'm concerned, but the, the you know, in principle, somebody who teaches uh, th those higher professions should have a certain dignity that pertains to them. Whereas the lower professions, it would be incongruous for lower professions to have that dignity. Garbage men, all right? Although I think I always praise the garbage men. They perform wonderful work. Uh, and life would be very, very unpleasant if we did not have garbage men. So I think they should get some special consideration. But as I was just saying that lower, you know, people who, I don't know, mow lawns or something like that, although they're important too, but the, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's incongruous that they should be living in a, a you know, million dollar mansion, you know, looking over the Pacific Ocean. It's incongruous. It's not necessarily wrong. It's just incongruous. It's, it, it's so you know there's gradations of of dignity and majesty that that are so that's why I say in other words you should you should it's congruous that you live and virtuous that you live according to your state see that's why for example the the bishop's residence was always a magnificent place I mean you look at the bishop's residences in the middle ages and uh because of the majesty of his state. See, and then the Novus Ordo ones would move into apartments and, because they were one with the people. And, you know, but they might as well anyway. It doesn't matter. So, I don't know what we got on that. But, um, so, uh, corporeal goods are for the furtherance of virtue. So if you have an excess of corporeal goods, then that impedes virtue. If you have a defect of it, it impedes virtue. Unless you are embracing voluntary poverty. The help of the church. In the Catholic Church, there is found the true religion of Christ. The true religion of Christ is also able to protect even civil society. Therefore, the church should not be separated from the state. That thing is perfected, which is joined to Christ. But we are joined to Christ through, through the true religion of Christ. It is therefore plain that the state is per perfect by its being joined with the church in which Christ never ceases to live as the head of his body. The supernatural order perfects the natural order, but the supernatural order has been constituted in the true religion of Christ, ergo. See, the point is that Christ is not someone simply for the category of religion. Christ is the, the head of the whole planet, church and state. So the whole planet has to be ordered to Christ in every respect. The Church of Christ has a most noble, firm, and efficacious moral doctrine, which is the foundation of social life, what I said before. It is most noble since it teaches perf perfectly all of the duties of men toward God, the government, and the domestic society, one's neighbors, subjects, and oneself. There is no religion that has such a strict morality as the Catholic religion. It also has confession, which tends to put a damper on sinning. In other words, that if you have to go to confession, which is a you know an unpleasant thing if you have to tell the priest you know some terrible things, that is a deterrent to sin. Remember Father Chicada said about the Anglicans, great music and no confessions. If all you have to do is be sorry to God and, and no, I'm sorry, God. You know I'm a sinner. Uh, that does, it's not a deterrent to sin. To have to go to confession is a deterrent to sin. So that, that's... Uh, uh, 
it makes for good employees because you have to do retrib uh, retribution, uh, rather uh, restitution, if you've stolen something from your employer. Or if you've cheated on insurance, restitution, you have to give it back. So the, the, the you know, this Catholic morality is very, very high. Indissolubility of marriage, where you can't even separate civilly without the permission of the ordinary. So you couldn't just walk out on your spouse. You have to get permission of the ordinary to separate. And if you do, you cannot marry again until one of you dies, should die. That is Catholic morality, and this is the Catholic state. And up to the 1960s, 50s, uh, divorce was prohibited in Italy. And then uh, under Paul VI, it was, and I think he promoted it, if I recall, or did virtually nothing to stop it. Everything fell apart under Paul VI. So, Saint Paul VI. It is firm since it is founded in religion. If one should take a religion away, society would have only a defective and very fluid morality because it would depend on natural law only and people who are infected with original sin and who have no sense of the supernatural order uh, being the, the interpreters, you might say, of the natural law. So you see that with abortion, that these nine idiots on the Supreme Court in 1973 decide, well, there's a right to privacy, so in order to be private, you can abort your baby. I mean, that's lunacy. And even, even leftists have said that there's no constitutional right, it's just not in there. Even leftists have said that, and now they're, they're, they're uh, well, let's, just, let's see if they do it. They'll probably burn down the White House or something. Uh, the, um, um, no, they'll burn down the Supreme Court. Um, but the, um, uh, they, they are finally discovering after 60 years, or 50 years, I guess, of, of killing babies that, well, you know, maybe there isn't a right to do this. <laughs> Yeah, that's how s the stupidity of it. Because original sin corrupts your mind. And you think that things which are evil are good. That's why you have the church. That's why you have a savior. The first order of salvation is the correction of your intellect by the faith because the first sin was an intellectual sin, the desire to have the knowledge of good and evil. So the, the, the first sanctification is the sanctification of the intellect and the reordering of the intellect because that obviously from everything, the, uh, the intellect gives rise to everything, all sorts of errors or the truth. See, but original sin inclines you to immorality it inclines you to lust and all sorts of other things and convenience. So you, you can kill your baby in order to be able to have more money or uh, avoid inconvenience, etc. I mean, with original sin, you can, you can reason to something as stupid as that. But the Catholic faith would not let you reason to something as stupid as that. See, so when you detach the, when, you know, Christ and his church from the state... It's just like sending a car down a cliff. But it'd be interesting to see if they if they uh, cancel Roe versus Wade. Well, what about those sixty million babies? Who's responsible? for the destruction of those babies if Roe versus Wade was a false judgment.
That's in this country alone. Somehow I think they will back off of it though because they're afraid of the leftists. We'll see. So, uh, it is efficacious since it obliges in conscience. See, it's not just a, a dead letter law. It obliges in conscience. Uh, so, one should add that the Catholic Church preserves three principles which are maximally social, the promotion of ordered progress, the antiquity of traditions, and authority. History confirms that great benefits were given to peoples by the church. This is, what is this? Immortality Day. Christian Europe has subdued barbarous nations. Boy, he's real. He, this would be <laughs> totally anti woke. Just that it's the statement. <laughs> Changed them from a savage to a civilized condition. Oh, gosh. Oh, terrible. From superstition to true worship. He, he, could, he would be uh, canceled on, on Twitter, I think. It victoriously rolled back the tide of Mohammedan conquest. Retained the headship of civilization. Stood forth in the front rank as the leader and teacher of all. In every branch of national culture. It's one sentence after the other. Bestowed on the world the gift of true and many-sided liberty and most wisely founded very numerous institutions for the solace of human suffering. And if we inquire how it was able to bring about so altered a condition of things, the answer is beyond all question, in large measure through religion under whose auspices so many great undertakings were set on foot through whose aid they were brought to completion." I pass over the prayers, the duties of heroic charity, and even monetary helps by which the church very often gave, gave aid to the civil power. But even in our time full of ruin and with the portents of many ruins, I think that should be portent. That's a T. Uh, especially in a moral crisis in which it languishes confirms the divine sentence, miseros facit populos peccatum. Sin makes the peoples miserable. He's writing this at 1900 or late 19th century. I just imagine what these authors would say today. If the <laughs> words they would find. Argument three from tradition, the early church, despite the pressure of persecution, gave precepts confirmed by examples which are contrary to the separation of powers. Uh, for apologists of the second and third century, namely St. Justin, that's the Theophilus, Tertullian, etc., tried to persuade the rulers that the state would not be impeded by the Christian religion, but helped by it. At times the church used the protection of the state when the occasion arose. Uh, for example, uh, in the late 200s, there was an appeal to the emperor about some church, I think in Antioch, that the, this, the, that the, and, the, and the emperor f found in favor of the Catholics. There was some sort of dispute. I think, be, yes, I think it was the Arians or some sort of her heretical sect that was trying to retain a church, and the, the Catholic Church said to the emperor, you should you know, intervene and, and uh, make a judgment here. And it happened to be an emperor that was favorable to the Christians. And uh, he did, and he found for the Catholics. 
In order to have assemblies of the faithful, the church defended itself with the laws of the altars of the sepulchres or the associations of people of lower rank. In a similar way, when Paul of Samosata fell from the true faith and at the same time from his episcopal see, but here we go, but did not want to leave his house in the church of Antioch, the ecclesiastical authority asked Aurelian, the emperor, to expel the heretic from the church by means of the secular power. So, that's in Eusebius. St. Ambrose said, after the faith had been accepted by the emperors, a good emperor seeks help for the church, but does not refuse it. St. Gregory the Great said, power over all men has been given to the piety of our lords for this end, that they be helped who seek good things, that the way to heaven be opened wider, that the terrestrial kingdom become the handmaid of the celestial kingdom. St. Isidore Pelusiota. The administration of things is composed of the priesthood and the kingdom. Although there is a great difference between them, the first is like the soul, the second like the body. And nevertheless, both tend toward the same end, that is the salvation of men. And the, uh, the Emperor Theodosius uh, 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 established in 382, I think it was, the union of church and state in, in the Roman Empire and banned Judaism and paganism. St. Nicholas teaches that the powers are distinct in such a way that Christian emperors need the pontiffs for eternal life and the pontiffs use imperial laws only for the course of temporal things to the extent that a temporal action be protected from carnal assaults. Excuse me, a spiritual action be protected from carnal assaults. So you can call the police if you have abortion baby killers in front of your church. Epistle, okay. St. Evo of Chartres wrote to Pascal II, since the kingdom and the priesthood are suitable to each other, the world is well ruled and the church flowers and bears fruit. Constantine the Great wanted to be called an episcopus ad extra, that is, a defender of the faith. In, that's obviously in a broad sense. Episcopos means overseer, so in Greek, epis, episcopanes, epi is this, and scopane is look. <laughs> so, you know, to make sure the church is defended, that's all. Charlemagne wanted to be called a devout defender of the church and its humble helper. In a similar way, the church defend, was, the, uh, was the church defended by St. Louis, the king of France, and by other rulers who truly worshipped God. So there were uh, uh, St. Henry, uh, St. Ferdinand of Spain, um, uh, Castile, it was in Spain yet, Castile, right? Ferdinand of Castile, no, is that St. Ferdinand of Castile? Yes, because the other Ferdinand of, of Aragon, that's uh, the husband of Isabella, he was no saint, I don't think. Isabella most probably was, but uh, she was Castile, yes. So I know my Spanish history. Yeah. <laughs> but there were other pious kings, and uh, yeah, not, not necessarily saints, but pious kings and who protected the church. Just the flourishing of the church, the building of the cathedrals. I mean, when you look at back at the Middle Ages, what are the big contributions of the Middle Ages? Theology and cathedrals. What else do they have? Ox carts. They perfected the ox cart. <laughs> you know, they, they made some progress in armor and perfection of steel, they did. Um, you know, minor, uh, the, 
the perfection of the method of stained glass, which is not known even to this day, how they achieved the, the colors, etc., of the stained glass. Nobody knows what they did. Architecture. But th th that's it. There's, you can just see that the whole mind of the Middle Ages was on eternal life. The whole culture. And they were no less intelligent than people are today. But the idea of going to the moon would have been considered to them to be absolutely absurd. Why would anybody go to the moon? What's in the moon? Or Mars? Why is anybody concerned about Mars? Is there gold on Mars? If there is, how would you get it out? <laughs> there is a gold asteroid. I don't know if you know that. A solid gold asteroid. There is. Now that would be worth going to. The <laughs> yes. Yes. And it would make the chalices cheaper. And, uh, <laughs> and everyone would be rich. <laughs> uh, the price of gold might drop a little bit, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it's some huge block of gold. And uh, if they could drag that back to Earth, that would be pretty good. So that would solve all the world's problems. <laughs> some of them, anyway. <laughs> so, but Mars? They could make a, a colony for the woke up there, and that would be very good. They could make their own planet of woke. But I can't think of any other contribution. If, you know, obvious relic of the Middle Ages than those two things. Chant. You know, it's, it, it, it contains very, very uh, fine melodies. You know what Mozart said. And by anonymous people. But some of those melodies, I mean, if you put them in, in, in opera, it would be the people would be screaming and applauding and everything like that if somebody sang them, if you put opera words to them. The melodies are so perfect and beautiful. So, but again, it's the faith. Even their literature always reflected religion. There's, there's no detective stories in the Middle Ages. It's always a theme, a religious theme in the relig Middle Ages. It was, it was a totally religious society and you know, people still committed sins but it, it was ordered as a, a society in which religion prevailed so where are we yeah that's right where we are Objections. Contraries expel each other mutually, but the church and state are like contraries, therefore the church should be separated from the state. Response. I distinguish the major. Contraries mutually expel each other from the same subject under the same aspect, I concede. From a diverse subject or under a diverse aspect, I deny. With regard to, this, to the minor state and church are distinct, I concede. Contraries, I deny. See, they do not they do not fight against each other, they complement each other. So there, there's no contrariness there. Instance, contrary ends indicate contrary powers, but the modern state regards as its ultimate end a terrestrial happiness, but the church regards eternal happiness, but these are contraries. Response, I distinguish the minor, the modern state, 
if it tends toward that acts against true, the true nature of the state, I concede. According to it, I deny. The modern state, if it separates temporal things from eternal things and God from man, adheres to the materialists. In other words, if it does not see uh, temporal things as contributing to eternal salvation, then it is materialistic. The fact that it does this very foolishly is proved in another place. But not even modern politicians can neglect the fact that religion is at least a moral force when there is an ordered connection of both powers. Even atheists said that. William James, I think, said that. It's a useful thing because it, uh, Immanuel Kant said that too, that you could not have a state without religion. Or because of the very happiness of temporal things, it sometimes appears to be very desirable. Instance, disparate things are separated by their nature, but the state and the church are disparate since the state rules the bodies and the church spirits. Response, I deny the minor and I distinguish the proof. By that partition of government, there is excluded a confusion of powers, I concede, an ordered connection, I deny. Neither the state, although proximately it regards temporal things, is a society of inanimate bodies. In other words, just totally material bodies. Nor is the church, which takes care of spiritual things, proximately a body of separated souls. But each power, each in its own way, rules men. Therefore, there is a need for an ordered concord between the two powers for the purpose of procuring the ordered combination of temporal things and eternal things. Objection two, true philosophy demands that civil society be a state which is called of pure right, but the state of pure right has nothing in common with the ecclesiastical power. The state of pure right flows from false philosophy, I concede. From true philosophy, I deny. Machiavelli and Kant, having advanced a philosophy not worthy of the name and infected with the errors of materialists and skeptics, disassociated religion and morality from the civil law. From this, they, the atheistic law was born as well as, the, as atheistic politics. Pure right is therefore a right without God. Let the atheists see how much this is in accordance with true philosophy. See, if you take God out of right, right is a moral faculty, just as your eye is a physical faculty. It's a moral faculty. That means a, an ability to perform an act, an a, ability meaning a... Uh, a moral ability, not only a physical ability, but uh, that that you have the, um, the let's say the liberty to to perform a certain act because it's in precisely accordance with morality. That's a right. See, so, um, so if you. And that right is is rooted in God. In other words, you, every act that you perform ultimately is ordered to God. Otherwise, it's immoral. It's wrong. And you can never have a right to do something wrong. It's against the very notion of right, and that's why it's called right. <laughs> in Latin, use. But it's the same principle. In other words, the object of right must be something that ultimately pertains to God, and it is, it, is, it, it is from God because God is the ultimate end of the whole universe. So since all actions have an end, they all must be connected ultimately to God. So right is rooted in God. If you take God out of right, the source of the right then is the state. And then you get Nazism and Communism all the totalitarian governments. 
that decide whether you have a right to do something or not. So once you pull God out of civil society, you're asking for totalitarian governments, which is exactly what we got uh, you know, when, after the French Revolution. So, but Kant did say that, that religion is useful for uh, the general morality of, of the people. He did say that. What is this?